Good afternoon. I'm Francis Levy. Ed Nersessian and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. And welcome to Living in the Musical Moment, Lewis Porter's now famed and infamous jazz series. And jazz guitar is our subject this afternoon. Uh, we wish to thank the New York State Council on the Arts and the Department of Cultural Affairs for their help in sponsoring this event. Now, before we begin, I wanted to make a couple of announcements about uh, up-and-coming events. Uh, firstly, the art exhibit you see on the wall is, was from our roundtable, The Art of the Graphic Novel. And this is a, an exhibit which is to be viewed as well as read, or read as well as viewed. And it's a fascinating exhibit of the art of graphic novels featuring the work of such artists and writers as James Sturm, Ben Couture, and Tracy White. So uh, take a look at that after uh, the performance and discussion. Our film series continues on February 25th with... Max Ophel's uh, Letter from an Unknown Woman. And this is a film that was chosen by the novelist Tom McCarthy, uh, who wrote Remainder and whose book C was shortlisted for the Man Booker this past year. And Tom McCarthy will be here for that particular um, uh, film showing, uh, at, for which there will be a discussion afterwards with him and Matthew Von Unworth, our uh, media programmer. By the way, speaking of writers, we have a visitor today, Jay Neugeborn, who actually is a student of one of our talented... Uh, Jay, you want to stand up and introduce yourself? Jay is the author of, of a wonderful novel, 1940, and a, a collection of short stories which will be coming out in the spring, right? In May. So, uh, and he studies Ken Wessel. So uh, there's a reason for our madness. Our Big Question series continues on February 26th with the limitations of physical and mental reality. Gregory Chaitin, the discoverer of the Omega number, will be on the panel with Tim Maudlin, professor of philosophy at Rutgers, and Ed Nelson, professor of math at Princeton, who is the author of Quantum, Quantum Fluctuations, Predicative Arithmetic. And Ed Nelson has been here on a previous mathematics panel. Some of you may remember him. On March 1st, poetry returns with From Homer to 2001, Greek poetry through the millennia. Say no more. A small subject. <laughs> uh, and on March 12th, Big Questions continues with Theories of Everything, which will include a uh, rather interesting panel. Gareth Williams, who was here on our Origins of Tragedy panel, is coming to discuss Lucretius's Dororum Natura, which is one of the earliest, along with Democritus, one of the earliest seminal works which tried to describe and integrate the nature of the physical and metaphysical world. And we'll be taking going from Dororum Natura to string theory with Hermann Verlind, Verlind from Princeton, uh, who's a physicist at Princeton, and others. Um, on, uh, and I think that's about it for the announcements. Now, all Philoctetes events are available. If you go to www.philoctetes.org, like right now you could see it at home. It's simulcast. You can also go on the left side of our site where, they say, where it's past programming, and all of, all of these events, like today's, are shot on a three-camera setup and videoed. So you can see any Philoctetes event by going there or by going to our YouTube channel. Lastly, we need your support. So any contributions are greatly... Uh, are greatly uh, accepted. <laughs> uh, and now, without further ado, I will, I'm pleased to present Lewis Porter. Lewis Porter, Ph.D., is a jazz pianist and professor of music at Rutgers University in Newark, where he is the founding director of the world's only master's program in jazz history. He is known worldwide for his teaching and for his many books and articles, especially John Coltrane, His Life in Music. He edited the John Coltrane Reference, which appeared in January 2008. As a pianist and keyboardist, he has performed recently with such artists as Dave Liebman, Wycliffe Gordon, Ravi Coltrane, and Badal Roy. And he's toured Europe many times, but he's refused to take me on any of these <laughs> tours. Woody as I am. Uh, and he's performed in, in Israel, in Italy, Germany, and Spain. And his CD, Italian Encounter, recorded live at Siena Jazz, has received rave reviews. Jazz Times says that Porter is a hell of a piano player, and I can attest to that fact that he's also a great guy. And his new CD, Transformation, presents duets with fellow pianist and Berkeley professor Mark Rossi, who was here last time. It's amazing, and I urge you to buy the CD after we convene here. And you have CDs, am I correct? Yeah, both uh, Kenny and I have CDs with us. And Kenny has CDs, too, so take it away. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. Uh, first, just uh, about my guest, Kenny Wells is a good friend of mine, as you can already tell, he's a great player, great person, great teacher, as uh, I'm sure you can attest, you know, he's a terrific <laughs> teacher. And um, we've known each other about 20 years now, I think, yep. since I was uh, 14 and he was 12. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so don't get any funny ideas. But, um, and uh, he's done a lot of stuff. He's toured the world with Ornette Coleman, the famous Ornette Coleman. Um, he's been in, in groups with our mutual friend, Badal Roy. He was working with Badal before I knew Badal. And uh, he's led his own groups. And right now, you're in four or five different bands. Do you want to tell them some of the groups you're in right now, just so they know? Or? Let's see. I have a, I have a, a group of my own with um, the quartet with uh, Russ Meisner and Matt Pavolka and Lisa Peratt. Mm -hmm. And then I'm playing with Adam Rudolph, um, who's a, a great sort of world music percussionist and composer. He puts and composer. together these kind of motley big groups. He has, a, he has a, a, a big sort of improvising orchestra called the Organic Orchestra that works with a lot of interesting um, sort of musical structures and concepts. And then he also has a smaller group called the uh, Moving Pictures Octet that I'm involved in. Right. And yeah. I still work with Badal with some different... Um, yeah, exactly. There's a trio yeah. that you yeah. guys do a lot of work in. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, he's very active. I'm very pleased to have him here today. And uh, uh, what I said to Kenny, you could tell him this is the honest truth before the first number. What, what I like to do in this series is to give you an idea what the preconditions are for each improvisation. Uh, for standard jazz, you usually have a song that you're working off. But what I said to you, and you can tell him this is the truth, I said, let's, let's start with bleeps and blops. That's what I said. That could be a name for that one, I guess. Bleeps and blops. So these are, I don't know if that's a bleep or a blop. But. <laughs> so that was a free improvisation. That one we didn't actually have anything worked out, except for if you want to think of it as that little bit of a sound hint. You know, bleeps and blops gives you a little bit of an idea, you know. But, but um, yeah, so some kind, sometimes um, you know, non-musical images can be a great way to, to uh, start your um, musical thought process. Yeah. You know, yeah. A, a shape. You can just draw a shape on a piece of paper. There's lots of composers, you know, contemporary composers who work that way now. Um, but or, they leave room for the uh, musicians yeah, to, the, it, you to know, fill in. You know. A color, an image. Um, you know, when he said bleeps and blops, it was sort of very evocative. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, that's, that's certainly a place to start. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to play a few, a variety of things today, um, uh, you know, using different kind of bases for improvisation. And we take your questions all the way through, so feel free if you're not familiar. Some of you have been here before. But if you're not familiar, you could raise your hand now if anybody wants to. <laughs> or you could wait till we've played a little more and then... Ask us whatever you want. Um, but, all right, so uh, we th were thinking of uh, going with a standard now, All of Me. Okay. All of Me, that's, a, that's an old song. It goes back to, I'm not sure Area. exactly, but it's about 1932, 33, something like that. It's been around quite a while. And uh, it's kind of fun to improvise on. So maybe to start with, before we improvise, let's just, I'll play... Uh, the accompaniment and just play the, the tune, kind of? Yeah. Is that and then keep going, or, or just Let sort of... Just stop there, just okay. to make sure they, they know this one. So we'll go like, one, two, three, four. <laughs>
That was just about all of me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know. It's a funny thing, because I was playing the bass line uh, up here at first. I was playing it. Um, and all I did was bring it. And it swung a lot better down there. <laughs> you could feel it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You could feel it. Just by putting the bass line lower, it, it resonated better. It just feels better. It depends on the piano, too. Some pianos have sound different in different octaves, you know. But it also separates sort of our, where our sound is. A that's true, more. yeah. It's a kid, it's a, uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am? Say it again? Coming through the speakers, like? Well, we. Uh, uh, I don't think. I don't it's think it's amplified. I think they're recording it, but there well, could be. Case, there could be something going on. Yeah. Recording. Sorry about that. I don't know if they can do something about it. Yes, ma'am. I, I loved it, and it's wonderful. And maybe you want to dance. Good. <laughs> That's appropriate. You feel it, right? So I don't want to ask you to begin with, uh, you know, a tune you would know. And how much of this is already kind of in the repertoire that you already know? Well, that's the thing that people need to understand is that uh, jazz improvisation, whenever you play a, a song, jazz improvisation is based on the chords of that song. And we know what the chords are. We know. First, we have an A flat chord. Then we have a C chord. You see what I mean? So you're playing these chords under the melody, but what you do is you keep playing those chords, and everything after the melody is improvisation. But what you do is it's a discipline that you learn over years and years is learning to improvise over the chords. You know? So that's the part. It's good you asked that because that's the part people don't understand. That, that, and jazz musicians are guilty of this too. They say, well, what I'm doing is playing what I feel. And I'm like, and how did that come out to be an A flat? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? That's the only key you felt, that you could feel it in right now is A flat. So the, the, it's kind of un mystifying. They, they try to underplay the discipline and they exaggerate the mysticism of it. And that helps everybody to be totally confused. Okay? But actually, it's a discipline that you work at for years and years. Because believe me, the first time you improvise on the chords, it's not going to sound like what we did. You know, the first time it's going to sound like. That's how it sounds when you first start learning it. You know? So yeah. it takes a long time to, to feel really loose with it. And, and to study the tradition. By now, jazz has been going for about 100 years. So there's a tradition of improvisers that you can study and see what they do, and so forth and so on. You know? yeah. And this gentleman had a question. I think, first of all, and perhaps part of my question Good. is answered. But my question was, how does it work between so, so for example, I see sometimes you're, if you will, together, and that's really exciting music. Other times, you're off in different places, but you're not totally cognizant of the other. Right. That's beautiful music. <laughs> so, I mean, okay. but there's no one here telling you. How do you guys communicate while you're playing? What do you think? What can we tell them about this? Well, I think that's one, that's one of the really um, uh, sort of challenging and really exciting things about this music is, um, is being able to listen and interact at the same time. So it really, it's really, um, and that's one of the things you actually have to practice doing, um, but um, uh, you, you ha have to always be aware of the structure of the tune, as, as Lewis was talking before, because we're sort of working inside that structure. Um, but you're also, you have your ears open and you're, use, and you're reacting to what's, what you're hearing. So um, sometimes you might be, I think m music is, is well, all art is sort of about um, consonance and dissonance and tension and release. And sometimes you want to be resolved, either harmonically or rhythmically to what you're hearing. Sometimes you want to play something against that. And like you said before, sometimes we were together. Sometimes we're sort of a little bit in different um, uh, spheres, and I think that that can coexist. You, you might want to have a different, you might, might want to create some of that tension um, right. with just rhythmically or harmonically. And uh, but yeah, I think the, the, the idea is it's, a, it's sort of a conversation, so it's never the same. Um, you don't really have a con we don't have a conversation scripted now, but 
If yeah. you said something, I might react with a different something else that that I was I hadn't might not have been thinking about. So that's sort of what what happens here. Yeah. And again, that's again that comes with experience. And you know, when you're first learning to do it, you're so. Uh, concentrating just to get a right note that fits with the chord. You're not free to, to interact, really. So, but with experience, you get relaxed with it, and you're able to hear what other people do. And you, and you hear that a lot. I think there's a lot of, um, when you hear musicians that play a lot of time, uh, they, they play a lot by themselves, and they maybe haven't played in groups, or, uh, and then they get together. With, they might be an incredible musician, great ears and great time, great ideas, but if they're not used to this kind of... Um, uh, activity or sort of thought process, um, you find that they might be playing great, but there's not a there's not this communication going on. So that their time might be or their rhythmic feel might be really separate and not interactive. Because another thing, we have to you have to feel, you know, two people don't have the same heartbeats. You know, you have to sort of feel the same. You have to feel the same pulse. Yeah. And we have to constantly interact since we're not machines. We have to constantly interact. You know, the breath and and. You know, things move, go faster and slower with human beings, so we're constantly adjusting our rhythmic feel. But if you're used to playing by yourself all the time, you're just listening, you're just hearing your own internal time, and that's, that can be a problem. Yeah. So, yeah, it is, it is a discipline. To... One of my graduate students made an interesting comment once. He said, if you think of it as a conversation, um, you wouldn't consider it a good conversation if everything that you said, the other person echoed it back. That would yeah. seem, and musically, you would think that's an obvious thing to do. I'm just going to copy, kind of send it back to me. So that actually would not be, if you think about it, that's actually how you can irritate somebody, is to echo it back all the time. He said you might want a little bit of that just for fun, but more often you want a, requ- you know, a, a response as opposed to echoing it back. You know? so, uh, and the other thing is there are certain agreements. So, for example, there's kind of an agreement with this kind of thing. The first one was a totally free interaction. But there's an agreement when you play on a tune like this uh, that uh, you kind of take turns being featured. So, for example, let's just do uh, I accompany you for a few measures, you accompany me. So when I accompany him, I play a certain way so that he can kind of be prominent. One, two, three, four, from the beginning of the course. agreement, there, there, there's tradition in terms of how you let one person come forth and be prominent at a certain point. You know? mm-hmm. So that part of the conversation, even though it's not scripted, we, we kind of know we're going to do that at some point. You know? if I, I have an interesting, uh, there's an image that I, I use, I, I use it with my students occasionally. When, I, when people ask me what, what I think about, I think it's more an answer to your question about um, you know, what are we playing, are we improvising, what are we playing over? And, and Lewis was mentioning that there's a structure of the tune. And I like to think about it. Um, I like to go hiking. Well, I don't know if there are hikers in the audience in the here. <laughs> you got a few, it looks but, like. But um, uh, when, you're, when you're hiking on a trail, you see usually often there are these um, like trail markers. Yeah, these, I mean, yeah like, a, like a red uh, triangle. And you follow the one in the red triangle all the way through the woods. So you're, you're in the woods or you're on a, in a field someplace. And you sort of see up ahead the next tree that's marked, or the next three trees. So um, you could go on that. Tr- if you want to go on the trail, you'll sort of follow that, follow those marks. Now you can go off the trail and still, still hike, right? And if you certainly, if you know where the trail is, you can go off. And say, I want to go look at this. I heard a sound in the woods, so I want to go check out what that was. Or I hear the water rushing, and that's not near the trail. Maybe I'll go off the trail and come back to the trail. So I said, it's very analogous to me about like a structure of a song. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a set of chord changes, which is sort of like the, the, uh, the trail. And uh, our trail markers are sort of like um, the language, the musical language that we use uh, to agree with the chords. Like if, if there's a chord, like an A-flat chord, like Lewis said before. Uh, I'm just 
just gonna rip. So here's a, the, ah. that's the first two chords. So I might play something that's exactly, exactly outlines the chords. So I can, I'm at, now I might play something a little bit still in the key, but outside of the chords a little bit. play things outside of the chords, so it's not even the key, like off the trail completely. So I, I find that it's a good demonstration. Yeah, this, that's one thing. Yeah, uh, that's a little loop pedal you can sort of. But um, we're talking about tension and release before you sort of, as musicians, uh, we sort of build up the craft of trying to stay on the trail, get, getting our discipline so we can see the trail markers and outline the trail, and also as you get more um, uh, involved in the music and more. Maybe your eyes, ideas get a little bit more interesting. You say, "Well, I'll get off the trail a little bit." And so, if you know where, if you know where, uh, if you know where the trail is, you can go off the trail and come back. So, if you don't know where the trail is, it gets a lot harder to exactly. do that. I don't know, that's a sort of an image that I sort of like. That's I like where to... I get. Let's play a little, and we'll take some more questions. Let's okay. play a little more. But uh, that's why I say I don't want people to forget that there is a discipline. It's not just playing what you feel. You need a discipline to do it. Do you want to do that, uh, um, Rog in D? Uh, Lydian. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we're both interested in Indian music and we both work with Badal Roy, tabla player. And uh, there's actually a couple other tabla players I'm working with now. And there's a great one. It's an American named Dan Johnson. He plays great. And another one from India. And um, in Indian, in traditional Indian class, what they call classical music, I should say. Uh, they don't use uh, harmony in the Western sense. What they do is they have a, a scale that they play on. And this is, uh, it, well, we're using the key of D, and in, uh, in India they call it, in North India, they call this Rag Yaman, uh, I guess in English, in, uh, uh, our letters should say Y A M A N, and we call it Lydian. It's uh, actually it turns out to be one that we're familiar with in the Western world, you know.
That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> well, Indian music is like that, by the way. North Indian music. It's, uh, you know, they, they talk about trance states and all this. I mean, the truth is you're supposed to be concentrating, but it's a kind of concentration that it can, it can be soothing because it kind of takes your mind off of other things, you know? It's like meditation in that way. You know, it's not the, it's, uh, but it's not so much the idea you're supposed to think about nothing. You're actually supposed to be focused in on that music. But it draws you in in such a way. Part of the, the reason may be because it is just based on the scale. So it's a, the, the basis of it is so transparent. I mean, you, I'm playing the scale at the beginning. You can hear what the scale is. And then everything's based on that. So you can kind of follow it. And you can hear what's happening, you know? Yes, ma'am, you've been waiting. I'm thinking in terms of boundaries and or limits. And in the previous sequence, when we talked about tracks, and going off the track, is there such a thing? as going too far, and if so, who makes that determination? Yeah, that's called going off the deep end. <laughs> what do you think? Um, well, I think it's, uh, um, you know, it's, again, it's, it comes back to sort of the people that you're with. You know, the, the, um, if I'm playing in a Dixieland group, and, I, and I'm playing very uh, modern or, or t t taking the, like I said, like what I was doing before, if I was playing a lot of notes outside of the chords, uh, which is, um, you know, acceptable in some circles, and in some it wouldn't. The, the Dixieland guys, they might throw, you know, their beer mugs at me or certainly wouldn't hire me again <laughs> if I did that. Um, and, it, you know, by the same token, if I was playing with a, you know, a bunch of very creative sort of modern musicians and playing very much sort of inside or very... Uh, traditional, they would be. They would feel um, probably constrained by that. So it really depends on who you're who you're playing with. And I think I don't. I, I probably can speak for Lewis, but I, but my 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 feeling is um, I want to get around. I want to surround myself with musicians who they're really um, who are sensitive enough and um, open enough to. To uh, what's going on around them, that sort of there really are no boundaries. That there no, there's nothing that's off limits musically, if they're being sensitive to each other. Now again, if you're if you're um, sort of yelling at somebody on the on your from your instrument and sort of hostility or whatever it is, um, that's another story. But if I think musically, if 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 everybody has the same goal, which is to uh, listen to each other and to um, create something interesting and beautiful, then I think actually your cho your choice of notes and rhythms and anything you want to use from the sonic palette should be within bounds. All right, but that's an interesting. What's interesting about that is in classical music, you get instruments yelling at each other, and it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's oh. why I asked: Is there a risk? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean. But I'm not sure what you mean. You mean that the composer is written? Yes. You know, you know, like uh, Stravinsky. What's the famous? Yeah. You know. So yeah, that can be. Yeah, I, I would say to. that would be acceptable. Certainly, if um, if that's the if, point of the piece. If that's, if that's the point the of the piece. Of yeah. The piece. Yeah. Well, sure. when that first came out, that wasn't so acceptable. People, no. Right. People yeah. Got upset. It was a famous that's riot. Outside. Right. Not sure. Jazz yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but but there can be a piece that's intentionally like that, and then it would be. Well, fun. I mean, uh, there's. Like I mean, Stavinsky. one of the guys that that I've worked with that Lewis mentioned, Ornette Coleman, when he first came out and played, in, like in the '50s, when he was playing his uh, uh, his his own music in his own style. I mean, people were they thought he was, um, you know, it was, it was similar to the Rite of Spring. If people, yeah, they didn't have riots, but there was. There was a lot of controversy. This guy is—he doesn't know what he's doing. He can't play the instrument. He's fooling us. He's a charlatan. He's not making choices. He's limited because he doesn't have talent. Well, whatever. Yeah. So they said they he really saying. wasn't. So that there, there has been certainly, uh, yeah. There, there's been controversy in the jazz field too about oh, this is too far. But that's really from the critics or, or from the audience. I think you're talking more about from the, music, the musicians themselves. Is, is there anything out of bounds? And I think as long as I think you're right. Depends who you're playing with. You know? Yeah, yeah. And if everybody's sort of like-minded about trying to, if you sort of trust who you're with, then I think yeah, if they start doing something that you've never heard before, or it's a very harsh sound, or you might want to. Well, let me see if I can try to make some music with that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah uh, th this question is really for Lewis. It seemed like near the end of the piece, uh, Ken was really off in a great place, and you were at the, the, the piano, and it seemed like you were, you were thinking about what can I do at that point to really complement where Ken is, and it seemed like you were going through what to me was sort of visible decision-making process, <laughs> and, and, and continuing though just to play a minimal bass line right. at that point. So I'm wondering, is what seemed apparent to me about the decision-making process you were involved in what was what was really going on in your head? Yeah, I mean, when you say towards the end or at the end, I mean, I'm not sure well, exactly was, what you mean. Well, it was not quite at the end of the piece, but it was... Was it when he had the echo thing going? Yeah, I know, maybe a little bit before Okay. That. Yeah, well, you're, you're right. There was a point before that where, I, you know, I was just listening and thinking, what will go with this, you know? Right. Something like this or whatever. And then when he got the echo thing, you were building something with that, so I wanted to keep out of the way of that. Exactly. And so I said, well, that's better for me not to play too much there. And right. then I just had the idea to play the scale one. When, when, as you were fading it out, I had the idea to, to play the scale one more time. And then we both heard that that was a good place that's to end. Right. You know? And we actually felt good about it. If you watched us, we mm -hmm. felt good. We liked yeah. that end. Yeah. We felt good about it. But, but it was I like th strumming a harp at the end, kind of. I, th I think one, one of the, uh, um, it's interesting, that's, that's sort of, Interesting to be in a, in a crowd like this, where people are sort of involved in, in you know, in, in the music and thinking. And but um, you know, making a choice to not play is is, is a musical choice because music, yeah. music is sound and silence. And uh, you know, if you're playing all the time, you know, that can be really uh, it's too much. Sometimes even, you want to keep out of the way. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you've been waiting, and I think did you have a question before? Did you? If you want to, and then we're going to play another piece after these. Well, I had a couple, but one was, can you teach this? And you said, because I play classical. Right. And That's good. And so I read notes. And the second is, and my class teacher is fantastic, and she concentrizes. She doesn't, she says she can't play jazz. Who's your teacher? Ellen Genet. And she's French, and she's an amazing teacher. Yeah, well, I mean. You know, Vladimir Harris and Andre Watts couldn't play jazz. I mean, it's not a, that's not about how good you are, but go so ahead. It's hard to teach. The second thing is, do you have to have some kind of perfect pitch or relative pitch to be able to know what, how it will sound if we play it? Yeah, okay. Uh, I want to just mention the pitch thing, and you can talk about teaching it. Uh, absolutely, you have to have it. Uh, you don't need perfect pitch. A perfect pitch, just to be sure you know, is the, the ability to, uh, na to name a note when you hear it, you know. And uh, you don't need that. Uh, that's... Um, it can be a curse. <laughs> What's that? That can be a curse. Yeah, I know some people that get disturbed by it because you know, they can play the piano. The, the piano's not bad, but they can hear the, the notes that are out of tune and go, oh, it's killing me, you know. But uh, it was relative pitch. You go, close enough, it's relative. But... Um, you can hear the difference, but it doesn't bother you. But um, so, so relative pitch for those who don't know, it's that's if you hear if if you if you know what one note is, you can hear the other notes against that. Oh, I know that's a yeah. D, so I can hear that this is a fifth against that. And if you can hear the notes r related to one note, so that's what I think. And you yeah. can you can develop that with ear training. And they say you can develop perfect pitch. I've never really. Um, yeah, I actually tried. I know a little about that. There's yeah. a long conversation that I could tell you about. I, I've worked on it a little bit. But it's not easy. But um, uh, but the relative pitch you absolutely do need. But or you wouldn't you wouldn't hear that you're playing notes that don't fit. You know? So you absolutely do need that. And what about teaching? And, and, What's that? You said you can learn that. Uh, you can work on it. Sure. There's uh, it's you called can ear training. There's a lot of you can definitely learn relative pitch. Sure. Training. There's a lot of free materials on the web even for ear training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I remember reading an article recently that um, ask your teacher that uh, that. I'm talking about perfect pitch, and they were, the article was saying that uh, in America there's sort of a, a very low um, number of people with perfect pitch that they were studying. Right. And in, in, in cultures that have pitched languages, oh, that's interesting. like some African language and Chinese, that it's a much higher... Yeah, the pitch is part of the meaning. Much higher, you know, when pitch is part of the meaning, and they, they, it's a, there's a much higher um, frequency of people who have perfect pitch. That's interesting. And supposedly... Um, even 
Um, today, people do less singing in the house, and then, you know, I mean, you know, a hundred years ago, people would people would do that. In America, they would do more right. singing around like the piano, singing and, and stuff. You don't really yeah. get so. So we're sort of um, perfect pitches becoming less common. That's interesting over here. Yeah. But I, yeah, I've, like Liz, I had a friend who was a violinist, and she couldn't. She just had to stop playing in orchestras because she just. It was like getting a pin stuck in her. Oh Somebody was a little bit flat, or it just—it was physical. I couldn't. I can't do it. It's just like a curse. Your training. Your training. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, I think she had a teaching question too. Oh, can oh, you teach? Can this? you teach it? Yeah, definitely. You can definitely teach improvisation. I mean, Lewis um, I mean, works at Rutgers, you know, Newark, which is uh, you know um, one institution that teaches jazz. And I've been teaching it in schools and privately for many years. Yeah, that there's, you can definitely do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we more or less probably taught ourselves. That's how it was for me. I, at I least. had I had teachers you too. Had some yeah, teachers? I mean, okay. I definitely was um, working on the working on it with friends at a, at a young age. But also, I had teachers. Okay. That, uh, private teachers. Uh, it. It, it, there, there are, there are. Um, I would say yes to that. But let's see. What he says. Yeah, there, there, the there, question um, was: Is it harder to teach someone who already is a classical musician? There's sort of pluses and minuses because the classical, often yeah, classical we'll musicians to. have, have uh, you know, great facility and technique and sort of understand the instrument and the mechanics. But often there's a real, um, there's a, like a sort of a fear there yeah. of going off the page. I find it's very hard. So you, you know, you really have to uh, sort of work on that. You know, get, get, getting them getting them away from the page, and yeah, I, yeah it's a, that's the challenge. With people who aren't classical musicians and may not know anything about their instrument, that's another challenge. But you're sort of also working on, you know, the technique and the mechanics at the same time they're working yeah. on improvisation. You do need that. Uh, you've been waiting, and then if you could hold on to that, we're going to play a little and come back to some more questions. But go ahead. You've been waiting a while. Just going back to your metaphor about uh, taking a hike in Well, again, it's it's for for um, uh, for me, it's really about consonance and dissonance, you know, and getting the and getting the um, it's like a painter that has you know a bunch of different colors. Um, you know, you want to know your color theory if you're going to paint. If you're a musician, you really want to know about consonants and dissonance. You want to know what notes are agree with this chord or with this thing, with the structure. What notes have a little bit less agreement but still sound OK, and what notes don't agree at all. And there's a relative, you can actually go down a scale and say, oh, here's the note. There are 11 other notes. You can sort of see this is the most consonant. This is the all the way down to number 11, which is the least consonant. And if you have that, if you understand that, and you, then then you um, then it's just a question of sort of taste and other. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it, but that's sort of how I, I look at look at it. It's it's about it's about getting getting that mastering the consonants and dissonance on uh, in musical situations. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, I was in a class years ago, and one of the students raised his hand and asked the teacher when they go out. You know, when they're going away from the chords, how do they know what to play? And the teacher didn't know. He's, I don't know. And then for the student kind of answered it for himself. He said, I guess they just hear it. And uh, I mean, that is true, because you, you do have to hear it in your head before, you know, at the instant that you play it, really, like slightly before you play it. Um, and you know, if, if, if you enjoy music that has a little bit of dissonance in it, then you'll hear that. If not, then you won't. So you might as well not play something like that. You know. I mean, I love Stravinsky, Bartok, Prokofiev. I'm actually writing an orchestral piece now that will feature Dave, my friend Dave Liebman uh, that uses really more that kind of language. I'm very comfortable in that kind of language. So for me, you know, this kind of thing. That's, that's fine for me. For someone else, that, that's not going to be. So it has to be something that you hear and that you're comfortable with in your head. Uh, should we do that uh, tune of yours? And you can even tell them what that name means. Uh, Which one is that? Bahor Acha. Oh, ba oh Bahota Cha. <laughs> oh, OK. See, I don't know how this is. Tell them what the name of this is and what uh, it's based on. Th th this is a tune of mine, it, um, which for many, 
for a number of, for too long a time, was just called a working title. <laughs> and actually, it's on, a, it's on most of the sheets. That, well, I don't have a sheet here, but it just says working title on top. But it sort of um, was inspired by um, Indian music and working with Indian musicians. So um, I, I, I changed the title to Bohota Cha, which I think in Hindi means, um, are there any people who speak Hindi in here? Uh, I think it means just very good. <laughs> that's okay. People say Bohoda Cha. That's that's okay. That's good. <laughs> that's good. So. Stopping the key from ringing. Okay, that's not, that's not good. You want my, my music? I think stand? I know it by heart. Maybe I don't need to look at it. Let's try this. <laughs> All right, let's do it again. Count me in this time. Three, four, five.
very cool tune. Uh, just tell them a little bit what the what the the basis of it is. You know, the uh... well, um, I, I think what what um, the basis of it. Well, there, there, one of the things the that's, twelve bars, I guess. Oh, that's yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was going I was going to talk a little bit about the. Um, I, talk, I said it was an, um, inspired by Indian music, and um, one of the things you hear in this piece, at least the way it starts. Now, in, 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 in Indian music, if you if you guys have, have been to a concert or heard recordings, often you'll hear this um, a drone in the background. You'll hear sometimes it's with um, an instrument called a tambura or a tempura. Sometimes it's with an electronic box, but you'll hear the root. And the fifth, if it's in tune, so you'll hear that 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 in the key, and then they'll play this. They'll play that 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 will go under the whole piece. It might be an hour long. And that's called a drone. Um, so in this piece, the first chord I'm playing, it's just it's just two notes, the root and the fifth. So I sort of wanted that to be prevalent. And then there's another thing that was, um, because as Lewis said, Indian music has no harmony, meaning it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a um, vertical structure of music. Like in Western music, we have, we have this sort of moving harmony, chords. In Indian music, you'll have you know, one piece is in one scale or raga for an hour, hour and a half. They won't change keys. They won't, they won't have chords. So... Um, because of that, the other two elements of music, you know, there's mel melody, harmony, and rhythm, because there's no harmony, and Indian music is thousands of years old, um, consequently, the rhythm and the melody in Indian music is very sophisticated. So the rhythm of this piece is 5-4, which is not particularly sophisticated anymore, but it's a little bit more um, interesting than 4-4, four, four, or odd, maybe. And the, uh, the, the melodic, if you listen to Indian musicians play melodies. They never play a melody. Um, if this is your melody, they'll, ne they'll never, they'll always um, do these things called gamagans, which are these little slides, uh, little articulations. And they're very, it's, it's very um, sophisticated and beautiful. And I, I have not studied Indian music formally. I've taken some lessons here and there and listened to a lot of it and played with Indian musicians. But I started to try to emulate some of that. These kind of these kind of these kind of slides that they do. If they're going to approach a note, they might approach the note from above or below or above and below. So they, there's they never just play a note. <laughs> um, so I, I tried to get some of those elements in there, and it was a 12-bar tune. And I didn't really think about this when I wrote the tune, but. A tw twelve-bar form is is what a blues, um, uh, Western blues is. So it actually, it even though I wasn't thinking about a blues, it sort of is a blues, I guess. Yeah. Even I though it doesn't so. go to the traditional harmonic places of a blues. I think the phrasing. I, well, I wrote an article on this once. I think some the phrasing is maybe more important to a blues than the, than the, than than the, the harmony. Chords, yeah. Actually, more than people realize it. I, I, it was an article about when Nat's blues tunes, and I pointed out yeah. that a lot of his tunes are blues. But not because they do yeah. the, fir the one blues chord usually to goes to five, one you know. chord to four, and then the five. Four goes to the, that tune I just wrote. Didn't go to it went to the one, but didn't go to it went to the right. flat three. It nice. didn't, didn't like go it. to the five chord at all. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I think really the phrasing. I mean, it seems to. I mean, what you hit hit on was just what, what I was thinking about because I heard so much blues. Yeah. In the piece. Oh, that's interesting. And what I was wondering is that since I was hearing the view, the blues in the piece and seemed seemed like you, uh, you wrote it, so you naturally sort of flowed into it, is whether or not there's some intrinsic compatibility between these Indian scales mm -hmm. and our blues. That, that sort of lies at, you know, that a natural integration of the two. Because that's, again, the way the piece came across. Hmm. Well, I, I would say a few things about that. One is that they have scales that are like blues. They have one, Malkans, which is something like this. Which is kind of 
know, almost a bluesy sound anyway. But the second thing is, uh, don't forget, Kenny and I, being a, American musicians, are steeped in the blues. <laughs> so we are bringing that to the Indian music, ne not necessarily the other way around. Uh, and I should also mention, there's people that have been waiting. You were waiting, ma'am. You were waiting. Uh, this one was waiting. Let me just get to some of these people. You were waiting also. I'm sorry. But let me get to a couple of them. What's that? Um, about the the Malcowns? That the one before, the Lydian scale. That right. Big, that reminded me a lot of the pentatonic. It almost like a sister scale. Well, the blues and pentatonic are very related. Oh, yeah. Not so much to the Lydian. But equally spaced notes. Yeah, blues and pentatonic are very related. Not the Lydian, not so much. But yeah, there's a lot of international scales. It's like a whole study because you find certain scales come up in a lot of different cultures. Yes, ma'am. You were waiting before. I see. Well, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Point. Um, my question really goes back to sort of the previous discussion. Uh, um, do you uh, ever use uh, Tai Chi or any of that kind of discipline to help you find the, uh, the right place at the right time? It's interesting. I studied Tai Chi for many years. Is that right? For, you know, about 25 years, yeah. Really? And wow. since, I, since I had a son, I stopped practicing regularly. But I practiced regularly for like 20 years, like every morning, every night. That's amazing. I, I found that um, it just was a good, it was a good uh, um, method to, to sort of um, work within your body and get relaxed and work on alignment and be in the moment a little bit and yeah. it was it was it was great i don 't i don 't know how specifically it it uh, helped the music, but it definitely helped my mental state in, in with the yeah. music and I think there 's a lot of musicians who 've sort of gone to either martial arts or or some kind of meditation you know to help them both with their body and their mind so I yeah. Think yeah I mean you are an athlete of sorts you are using your body. But I, I always say that the only way to really learn something is to practice that thing. So the, there is nothing that's going to replace the discipline of knowing where to put your hands on the keys or knowing where to put your hands on the string. And the, I only mention that because a, a lot of times non-musicians will say to us, well, if you, like when we're talking about having a picture in your mind, if you just have a picture in your mind, that's after you have the discipline. Before that, that picture's not going to do anything for you. <laughs> Let, you know. So uh, all these other things are kind of incidental, really. But it, they certainly, you do have to be aware of your body. That's important. Yes, ma'am. You know, I think you answered my question, but maybe you could focus it a little bit more with why you're interested in Indian music. And is this something that is common among jazz musicians? Um, I think it's becoming more common because, yeah. as, you know, for for a number of reasons. One, because the you know the global in you know, the world is getting so much smaller with. Communication and travel and internet and you know people are sharing cultures in a lot so that's so it's it's easy to get both um, music you know recorded music available but also Indian musicians in New York City and uh, so but also um, I think really from probably from the 60s. At least the 60s, it, yeah, uh, jazz musicians have been going to India. Because Coltrane was interested Coltrane in India. And he didn't go to India, Kelly but he Monterey. met Ravi Shankar when he would come here on tour. So there, have been, uh, you know, there has been sort of a tradition since the 60s of Indian music. Um, and I, I'm, I, I think there are a lot of points of intersection between classical music and classical um, Indian music and, and jazz. One thing is that um, classical Indian music unlike Western classical music, is, is highly improvised. Yeah. It, they'll, they'll have a little melody. You'll see a piece of Indian music. Usually they don't have pieces written down, but if they do, it's just like it's a couple of lines. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like same a... Same notation? Uh, they, they can write in the same... Or they write in different notation, too. Yeah. There's both, I think. They have, There's both kinds. They have what they call... T uh, we call it also tablature, which is similar to diagrams for guitar. You see those? When you have a stringed instrument, you see the dots on the guitar diagram, you know, the little square. They have stuff like that, but they also, uh, a lot of them are familiar with what we would call Western notation, too. Yeah, but you'll, you'll so, that, so the improvisation is, is similar. I mean, the, 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 um, the discipline of improvisation in Indian and jazz. Also, as Lewis mentioned, some of the scales are very similar or identical to the ragas, which are the Indian well, Raga is a lot more 
sophisticated than a scale. A scale is just a, a, a sequence of notes in the West. And when we improvise with a scale, we really don't have any rules that, that are set. But in Indian music, a raga might be the same note, number of, it might be this, this could be a raga. The one we played before, the Lydian. But there may be a rule that, oh, well, if you're going to the raga, if you're going to the root, you cannot approach it from below. Right, there might exactly. be a rule like that, or then, and there are many rules and many phrases that become part of the raga, so it becomes this rich tradition. So it's, um, but there, there are similarities. And then I think ri- the rhythmic thing is very, is very, uh, is very compelling to, to jazz musicians, because yeah. jazz is sort of based on uh, polyrhythms and, and uh, sophisticated rhythms, and Indian music is very, very sophisticated rhythmically. Yeah. So um, I think... Uh, um, this one. Well, I enjoy very much uh, jazz uh, and uh, all kind of improvisation, including visual improvisation. I'm an artist. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And um, I feel that between what you play and what I'm doing is some kind of, you know, or, I mean, I, and please um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, between uh, improvisation and abstract art, especially uh, uh, abstract art as it was developed in America, um, is a very big uh, uh, parallel. Parallel, yeah, yeah. and maybe they intersect. Yeah, a lot of visual artists have been interested in jazz. Of course, Matisse has a famous series from the twenties, I think it is, and. Um, there also are artists, uh, you know, Jackson Pollock, they called the a- an action painter. There are action painters who work to jazz, you know. Yeah, and they use the body also, as you do. Well, that's true, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so there are there are commonalities, you know. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, you're just kind of talking in different languages, obviously. You know, they're using, you're using visual and colors and stuff, but there's definitely a commonality. And um, something else I was going to say about that... Um, Oh, yeah, uh, about the, the action painters. There was something else I was going to say. Do you have any other thoughts on this one? I'm trying to think. Well, um, I, I, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I, I, do a, I do a sort of a regular gig at this uh, playing for a life drawing class, at uh, improvising. Oh, really? That's good. But That's rec- recently I, I played at the Parsons, uh, the, uh, Parsons. I think it was the Parsons School, one okay. of the art schools in town. And they had, a, they had a band come in. It was our band quartet come in. And it was a, a long session they were drawing the, the. They were drawing us playing, but they wanted us to improvise and play. And uh, since it was such a long session, there was a lot of, there was a lot of time to talk. And uh, we we really, uh, I hadn't talked to artists so, so um, frankly about their process. And it was interesting. There were a lot oh, of, really? huh. a lot of parallels. They were talking about how their teacher was telling them, when they start a line, they have to, they just have to continue, and and they, you shouldn't. You know, once your pen's on the paper and you're starting, or whatever it is, the brush, you, you continue that thought and sort of see where it takes you. And you sort of, and there's a similar thing with improvisation. You sort of can't, once you play something, you can't take it away. You have to sort of follow that, that, that train of thought. It might not be what you expected. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes I hear what I play. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I hear what I'm playing before I play it. Sometimes I don't. I'm just like, oh, that it almost... As I play it, I say, yeah. oh, that's taking me to a different place. You can surprise yourself sometimes. I have one, uh, yeah. regarding to it. Uh, it is uh, sometimes the meaning uh, you want to convey, to transmit, whatever, uh, when you do a piece of improvisation. Or it's just surface. It's just play. Well, uh, uh, that's or, a big uh, question. Uh, <laughs> Noted by the structure of the... Yeah. There's a question that philosophers uh, talk about, of course, musicians do, too. What does music mean? You know, there's a book by that name as well. What does music mean? And uh, everyone, you know, every musician has his or her own answer to that. I mean, but the one thing that I like to point at is regardless of, of what else music means, uh, it is about sound. I mean, the, we love sounds, and we love playing around with sounds, just like a painter loves working with color. So you don't want to forget about that. You don't want to think it's... 
you know, it only means something else. The first thing that it means is the sounds. We love the sounds. Sometimes we, we like to say we're telling a story in sounds, but that doesn't mean it's a specific story. It's like I, I say to my students when you hear, when you hear Chopin's funeral march, you know somebody died, but it doesn't mean you know who died. <laughs> you don't know what they died from. You don't know how old they were. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> who killed them, why they killed them. You know, so, uh, you know, it's not that specific. It's really, it's about that the notes, not. you know. Yeah. It's about the notes. You tell a story, but I'm uh, talking about something else. Yeah, but no, we're just about out of time. This thing. is going to be the last I one. I still yeah. uh, have to convey an idea of joy, sadness. Yeah. Uh, All I'm saying is I don't think, at least for, for me, it's not that simple. Because every piece that we played so far today, to me, had joy and sadness and about 300 other things in it, you see. So for me, it's never that simple. It's never one thing that you could really clearly separate that way. That's for me. Okay. Do you take one more question? We have to finish. We're out of time. Thank you. We're going to play one more number for you. What did you want to know? Uh, no, I, what I think is... And you can talk to us after. And you can also come to either one of us. We have CDs of our music if you're interested. Okay. Yes, sir. It's kinesthetic, and uh, sometimes when people ask to define swing, I say the first thing you need to know is that swing is a sensation. It's a kinesthetic sensation. It's not this uh, intellectual concept. You know, you do have to feel it. Uh, let's just do my tomb gamelan, if yeah. you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, he made me do one of his, so I should make him do one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> but Gladly. actually, this tune, those of you that have been to others in the series, I... I like to do this tune with almost every guest that I've had so far. Not with every single one, but most of them. And uh, it, it's still taking on this theme of uh, Indian music, or maybe a little broader into Eastern music, uh, because uh, this uses a scale that's found both in India and in Indonesian gamelan music. The scale is... This actually is on the CD now. It's on the, the CD that I did with the table player, Badalvoy, the group Dharma Jazz. So.
Kenny Weston. Lewis Porter. <laughs> I got to tell you, I keep bringing the thing back in, but you got okay. it. Yeah. Yeah.